and now your bones are hidden. Everyone experiences compression. So try to start with the most obvious examples of compression. In our limbs, in the field, it's easier to demonstrate. And then we're going to move in towards your pelvis and your spine, where it's harder to feel, a little harder to demonstrate, but the principles are exactly the same. First area to show is how much you can rotate or pronate your feet, which is really your core. I grab hold of my elbow like this because I don't want to cheat and use my shoulder to do it. I touch my elbow in this way, grab it gently to remind myself, don't do this. Only do it from the elbow down. If I lay my hand open like this, the two bones in my forearm are parallel to one another. One bone, this long bone here, the old one, it doesn't move. But this bone on the outside going down towards your thumb, it does move. That's what enables you to turn your hand over. Supination and supination. When I try to turn my palm all the way over, at some point, compression here occurs. The soft tissue is compressed in here, and I can't rotate over the top anymore. Parallel, cross over. So now with flush on it, parallel bones, trying to cross the bone you can't see, over. And when that can't go anymore, it's due to compression. It's not tension. It isn't because something hasn't been adequately stretched that I can't do that. So for me, Start here, rotate, there's 90 degrees, there's another 45 degrees, slightly past that, maybe 135 degrees or so of rotation. But if Erin comes up and does this range of motion, and she holds her hand like this, these two bones in the arm are parallel to one another, and she rotates her hand over, it's crossing, crossing, crossing. And look how far she can go. So if we have Erin do what I just did, we have her hold her arm here just to remind her, don't do it from your shoulder, only do it from the elbow down. We ask Erin, turn it out as far as you can. She can actually turn past parallel. Now I say start your rotation, maybe 90 degrees, and I say, okay, about there. And then for me, I can go about that much further, and then I was done. Aaron can go another 45 degrees to there, another 45 degrees past that, almost another 45 degrees past that. And that's because of the shape of her bones that she was born with. Yoga didn't develop me. It's just the skeleton that she has. Yoga hasn't developed this in me, except what I have. Where will this come up? What difference does it make what you can do with your wrist? It comes up any time I place my elbows on the ground or arms straight to try to put my palms flat. So for me, if it were my goal to put my palms down, that's all I can do from the elbow down. The only thing else now I can do to get my palms the rest of the way to the ground is to rotate from my shoulder, which means my elbows are going to go. If I try to keep my elbows in, I can't have my palms on the ground. If I extend my arms, same thing. For me to put my palms flat on the ground, in a pose like this. It's got to come from my shoulder. That's why my elbow's going up, elbow's going up. If my elbows stay down and in, my palm will come off the ground. For Aaron to do this, she doesn't have to do anything with her shoulder. Just on the spot. So let's test it and see. Aaron comes forward, kneels down here, the way that I did for you. Places her forearms on the ground. She's already palms flat showing me up. 
Remember, I was here. And I'm trying to put my palms down. And I was stopped right there. That's all I could do. Aaron, palms down, no problem, because of how she can rotate here. She, even if there was a hole dug out here in the floor, Aaron could still put her palm on the edge, and she can turn over that much. So Aaron never has to use her shoulder rotation to place her palms on the ground. So if Aaron goes into a, a moderate downward dog, for Aaron to keep her palms on the ground, she can do any correction up with the shoulder she wants. And look, I can keep her, she can keep her palm on the ground. Elbows rolled in this way, elbows rolled out that way. She's got so much movement from the forearm down, she has an option of how she wants to manipulate her shoulders to keep her palms flat. I, with my limited range of motion, don't have an option. If I'm in this pose and my elbows are in this way, which is really a shoulder movement, my hand's gonna be up off the ground. The only way to put that down is to roll my elbow, which is my shoulder, down like that. It's easier to see when the elbow's bent, but it'd be the same shoulder rotation. Okay, thank you. So this comes up in any forearm balance that I might do. Headstand, scorpion, downward dog. Even if I turned around and went into the wheel, trying to keep my palms pressed, my hands palms flat to the ground. Not having as much range of motion as Aaron or someone else can make a huge difference in which joint am I moving to keep that palm on the floor. So here's a little principle that goes along with this. It comes up again and again when you're analyzing yourself or someone else. It's called the axis and the extremities. The axis of the body is sort of like it sounds. Anything closer to the center of the body is the axis. Anything further out towards your fingertips or your elbow or further down towards your knees and your feet is the extremity. Don't let the tail wag the dog. If you're one of those that can put your palms down flat in certain of these downward dog or forearm balancing positions, that's great. You're probably doing it mostly from your forearm. But don't compromise your shoulder or hurt yourself here close to the axis because your extremity can't do it. If your extremity can't do it, don't punish the axis of your body. Axis and extremity. In yoga, because it's easier to see our hands and it's easier to see our feet and our knees, they're not covered over with thick muscle and under our clothes. We tend to look at ourselves and others by looking at the hands and looking at the feet, assuming that's telling me what's happening here. I look at the hand, assuming that's telling me what's happening here. I look at the foot which we'll see later. Assuming that's telling me what's happening up here. And what we're gonna discover is that's not always the case. But because it's the easy thing to see, the easy thing to correct, we tend to focus on those things. Focusing on the extremities at the expense of what's happening at the axis is a mistake and will lead to frustration and injury. Two people who look the same on the outside when they're doing a pose are not feeling it the same on the inside. And this is the easiest example to give you. If you looked at Aaron and I, and we're both balancing our forearms or in downward dog, and you looked at our hands, I was wearing the long sleeves, you couldn't see my elbow and how it was twisting. You looked at our hands and say, okay, they're both doing it the same way. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm rotating 45 degrees in at my shoulder to make up for what my forearm won't give me. Erin, with her exceptional range of motion, could actually rotate her shoulder the opposite way 45 degrees and still have her palm flat on the ground. And yoga won't change this because this is compression. If it were due to tension, there was something that could be stretched, something was too tight. 
I've never done yoga before and I've had my arm in a cast. I might not be able to get this full range of motion because of tension. Well, then I slowly eventually get to here. But tension is not a resistance either. I feel no stretch anywhere that's inadequate. I feel only compression and there's nowhere to go. The next most easy place to discover tension and compression and contrast them is moving up the body from the extremity towards the axis is the elbow. If you can see, the bone of the forearm that can rotate and move is no structure part of your elbow. The bone that doesn't move, the ulna that goes down to your little finger, it forms a hook-shaped bone that fits right into that notch right there. And it pivot around, pivot, 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 until bang. It bangs the end of this little hook, bangs into the back of that socket. Now there's nowhere for it to go. And that's a form, again, of compression. A more aggressive and easy to feel compression. Here, it just sort of slowly squishes together until you can't squish anymore. But here, as the very sharp edge of a bone hits another bone cavity. So this is very easy to distinguish this compression. So again, if I go like this, I can't go anymore because of compression here. If I had a torn bicep tendon and I had surgery on it and I hadn't stretched it yet and I was going to rehabilitate myself, I might have to do massage and therapy and stretching to stretch this bicep out again so I get my elbow straight. This is tensile training, tensile training, tensile training, tensile training, compression. What I have to recognize is the type of training that I did to get to that point <coughs> is now inadequate to change what's happening from here on. If I were to think to myself, you know, it took me a month to get to here and another month to get to there. Well, then another month I should be down at this point, and another month I should be down at that end, and I should get good enough to whirl my own arm in a circle. Why doesn't that occur? Because of bony compression. This is tensile, 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 tensile compression. What can I do to change this? In yoga, safely, probably nothing. It's just the way that it is. It might be good for some things and bad for others, how much you can extend your elbow. If you look at Bob, if I turn Bob's arm like this, it looks like he's bent here. It looks like if you said about Bob, straighten your elbow out, it, says, it, sounds, it looks as if he's not paying attention to you. Say, Bob, straighten your elbow out. Doesn't happen. And what's more, when I tested this earlier with Bob, we have worked together before, he said it's always been like that. It's either he's got a large protruding part of the hook that goes into the elbow, or a shallow socket that's receiving that hook, or both. There's nowhere to go here. If I said to him, okay, Bob, just let me help you with that. This is not yoga, this is jiu-jitsu. <laughs> if his arm was like this and he had scar tissue here, and I'm taking my thumb in there and rubbing it so hard to break apart the scarring and I'm pulling his arm like this, now I'm helping him because I'm stretching out tensile resistance. Or he's doing yoga for himself. But once we get to here, either he does it by himself or I'm helping him, there's nowhere to go now. This is not bad for <coughs> to do this. It might actually be healthy for the bone to have a moderate amount of compression for the bone. But to go bang, 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 push hard to make it bend further, that's a huge mistake. And it's simple and easy to see in the elbow, but this same principle comes up in our backs, in our hips, in our hamstrings, and our knees, and it's harder to feel it there. So I'm spending more time in what probably seems very obvious to you. 
because this principle illustrates so clearly the difference, the problems between tension and compression. And in yoga, if this wasn't our elbow, if this was our hamstrings or our back, we'd be going, God, I love this yoga. It's making such a huge difference in my life. I'm opening up so much. This is amazing. I feel so good. And it's like, I'm not doing as good as I used to. And I went to this workshop and I hurt myself. Because at some point in there, we didn't recognize it changed from I was training the tensile tissues that were resisting this movement into the compression. That's why it's so important, why so much of this DVD is emphasizing compression, compression, compression. Because all of you have been attracted to yoga and do yoga because you love how it stretches you. You probably don't need any help from me or anyone else to learn how to feel a stretch. What's harder and is not emphasized enough in our training is when is it compression? And what do you do to modify your training if and when it is compression? So now what I'd like to do to contrast how much I could bend my elbow, let's call this normal, how much Bob couldn't bend his elbow, you'd call that hypo. Now let's bring up someone who is hyper. But please bear in mind, these are totally arbitrary things to say. Okay? It doesn't mean there's something wrong with Bob or wrong with me or wrong with someone who can bend more than me. These are arbitrary things of what deviates from 180 degrees. So let's bring forward this up. I hold her up, and this angle here is more than 180 degrees. I was about here. Bob was about here. Giselle is there. And I've worked with people who have an angle that goes off down like this. Is there anything Giselle has done wrong in her yoga to date to make her hyper mobile in this extension? No, it's just what she was born with. Could this work against her or for her in certain yoga postures? Yeah, might, maybe, but you don't know ahead of time. I've had students who can hyper extend, again, which is an arbitrary standard to say they're hyper, who can hyper extend a great deal. And they hyper extend in all of the arm balancing postures, except maybe handstand. They hyper extend in the wheel, they hyper extend in downward dog, and it feels great. For them not to hyper extend would be the equivalent of average folks like me not straighten my elbows out all the way. You feel like, gosh, I'm just not. I'm not exploring everything that's there, but I'll hold myself back. I don't know why, but I will. And there are other instances where, because of how the bone is shaped and their musculature and another hundred other variables about them, if they were to do the wheel or the downward dog and completely go to where they can hyperextend, that they can't feel a strain at the elbow that someone like me wouldn't feel. The point here is not to try to predetermine for yourself or anyone else, is it good or is it bad? Is this good or is it bad? That's not helpful. It's not helpful to try and come to that kind of decision, and it's unnecessary. This may be very good for certain things, very bad for others, or completely indifferent, that she never feels herself compromised in any pose. Whereas Bob, at the opposite extreme, he might also feel, no, no, I feel fine in every pose. I just don't get it all the way straight like everyone else. Or Bob might go, I never like to do downward dog. Because as soon as someone pushes on me to make me go deeper into downward dog, I get a big strain here. But you don't know ahead of time because there are so many other factors. But what we're trying to point out here is that this is going to show up when I do a downward dog or a wheel? And is it right or is it wrong? Is it helpful or is it not helpful? It varies from case to case. And why would you punish someone like Bob whose range of motion is here? And say, gosh, you're never doing the wheel correctly because you can't get your elbow straight. Well, he's never gonna get his elbow straight because of the shape of the bone. How can that be incorrect? Or, get Giselle bending like that. If she's not in any pain, why would I make her back off and go to here? 
Why would I say, no, no, you can't explore the full stretch of the joint and get that feeling? I'd only do that or advise her to do that if she was experiencing pain. But there's no reason to determine ahead of time what's the right angle of extension. What should it be? This big, broad piece of bone here is called your scapula. Hanging from it is the humerus. This shelf over the top of the humerus bone, this large bony shelf, which is part of the scapula, that's called the acromion process. It's probably one of the only Latin words you'll ever need to know because it's going to come up again and again and again because we use our shoulders so much when we move. The acromion process, which is a flattened extension of this ridge of the scapula. When we raise our arms up in this fashion, sooner or later, for everybody, the humerus hits the acromion. But everyone's acromion process is differently shaped. Some it's tilted up at a higher angle. Some it doesn't overhang as much to the side. Some it doesn't overhang as much towards the front. Those variations lend for huge variations of when is someone going to reach compression. Now for everyone, no matter how flexible or inflexible you may be, when you bring your arm up and you don't let your elbow go out to the side, it's called abduction. You don't let that arm abduct out to the side. You keep it in. When you bring it up, you're going to hit the acromion as soon as possible instant that you can. If I let my arm abduct out to the side, I can go around the acromion process. Now I will be compressing here on the back side between these two bones, but it's not as painful and not as aggressive. As you can imagine, this has huge consequences for when you do a wheel, when you do a downward dog, whether it elbows straight on Vrishkasana, doing a wheel or we the Viparita Dandasana like this. Anytime I need to draw my arms back, bent or straight, when compression occurs, it's over. Later we're going to see how the scapula movement adds to how far I can move. But right now we're just looking at this joint, just this joint. And like the elbow, like the wrist and like all the other joints we'll see in the body, the ultimate restriction is bone, what you were born with, what you came to yoga class with. That'll be the ultimate restriction. If the overlying musculature is tight, you might not know what your ultimate range of motion is because you can't stretch your muscles enough to get there. But after you've done enough yoga, then you're going to be stopped in your yoga postures by compression. Okay, let's turn Bob this way, same way I turned the skeleton. If you get up here and feel on Bob's shoulder, you say, wow, there's the acromion process right there. Here's the humerus right there. I ask Bob to relax. He trusts me. I raise his arm up, relax your muscle. I push up, relax more. It's like he can't go up any higher than that. I'm holding his scapula down so he can't cheat. His arm can't go up any higher than that. Look at the angle of his arm to his ear or his neck. That's it. So I hold her scapula down so she can't cheat and do this kind of stuff. So, okay, don't do that. And I slowly start to bring her arm up. Now that was Bob. Remember Bob? That was Bob. That's me. This is any normal person. <laughs> this is Ivy's mother. And this is Ivy on some type of steroid kind of diet. I don't know what. Bob here. Ivy here. Bob. <laughs> Ivy. <laughs> okay. Poor Bob. Yeah, I know. Bob and Ivy. Because Bob 
wasn't complaining down into here of, oh, my latissimus, my pectoralis, my corporobrachialis, my tricep, they're too tight. That was not a complaint. That would have been a tensile complaint. It's not stretched enough in here. Bob was the same. He had pain right here. Ivy has pain right there too, but I got to push her all the way back to there to find it. Now Ivy is also at compression, but her compression is here. Okay? This is what Ivy walked into the yoga class with. Now if Ivy had been a bodybuilder or a fastball pitcher and she'd torn her rotator cuffs and this had had surgery on it and it had all been scrunched down from surgery and she never really had worked it again because she was afraid, she might have come to the yoga class and done downward dogs and evil postures to stress it out. She might have been very tentative. Oh, I don't want to pop my shoulder out of the socket again. I don't want to injure myself again. But slowly, patiently, methodically, she had a good yoga teacher who was like, okay, we're not going to push you too hard, but we're going to keep working. You've got to keep working, Ivy. That's not going to get any better. And you're like, oh, wow, look at this. Wow, oh, I can, I can almost pitch again. And then it gets to here. And what brought her to here will now not take her safely any further. Because this has all been stretched out. There's nothing more to be stretched. What's now stopping her is compression. And once again, compression is not bad. Compression is actually good for the bones to gently compress the bone as a stimulus to their growth and their density. But it's one thing to do a wheel or a downward dog, gently get yourself to a point of compression and enjoy it. And another two here, help me. Pull me back just further so I can bend further. That could be injurious. I just going to demonstrate for us the downward dog. But before we get there, I'm going to do this with her. I'm going to ask her to stick her butt out so she doesn't lose her balance and give me her hands. So she bends over more and more and drops her chest down towards the floor. Right there, I'm staring at an angle at her shoulder that's about 180 degrees. Now she drops further down, fall into me a little bit. Look at her shoulders go back. She can go back that much because we're letting her roll her elbows a little bit. But even if I didn't, even I said, Ivy, turn in like that. Don't let your elbows roll out. Look at the angle of her shoulder. If I let her wing out, if I let her go around her acromion process, it's like incredible. Even hitting going onto the acromion process, drop down again. It's an incredible range of motion. Now, what do you think her downward dog is going to be like? I mean, goes into downward dog. She places her hands down. I step on her hands so it doesn't slide. And I say, okay, I keep those elbows in, keep those shoulders in. Even so, we know from having seen her before, she can get so much hyperextension, bad word, but that's how it's described, at the shoulder, that's not a problem for her. I can actually dig a hole out for her head and push her down further. And if I let her wing her elbows out like that, she can dig a hole to China and still have her head on the ground. <laughs> so when you saw Ivy, a ground's eye view of Ivy, this, this is just stretching under here. This is being pressed into her back. Feels really good. And Ivy is literally, if her hands and her feet don't slide, hanging out. Right? Her hands and her feet don't slide. It's a tensile suspended pose. Correct? Now, we bring, thank you. If we bring Bob back, flexibility of Ivy, most people aren't. So Bob gives me his hands, he sticks his butt out, he bends over, and then he bends his knees so he doesn't have to worry about his hamstring. Stick your butt out. There it is. I can't get Bob's arms from the same line as his back. Do you remember where Ivy's were? Like I can't get, I'm letting Bob's elbows wing like out to the side. I'm letting him go around that acromion process as much as he can with his shoulder. It isn't going. If I force Bob by grabbing his wrists and rolling his elbows and shoulders, not the elbows so much as the shoulder in, now look at the ankles, even worse. 
<laughs> stretch under here. I guarantee you, Bob is feeling the pain there on the top. But the compression is out. And we take Bob into a gentle downward dog. Think Bob's going to put his head on the floor? No, <laughs> 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 the most flexible hamstrings you've ever seen. But will he ever bang his head on the floor? And if I try to push on Bob like this, that hurts for him, sure. Because he's experiencing compression, right? Stop. I might not hurt him, and he might actually enjoy doing downward dog. He might like to put his hands against the wall or on a block or something. He might actually enjoy the downward dog. It might be a great feeling to just get that much out of it, to get that stretch in his arm and shoulder. He might enjoy it. But is Bob's downward dog ever going to be like Ivy's downward dog? Never. It'll never happen because of the shape of their bones. If two people look the same on the outside and how much they're bending to do a pose, they're not feeling it the same on the inside. Just imagine if Bob levered himself into his shoulder so deeply that he looked even remotely like Ivy. You think he, Ivy would be having the same experience in Downward Dog? Bob would be sweating bullets, probably doing something detrimental to his shoulder. Ivy's just hanging out. Or what if we did it the opposite way? And so we make Ivy only bring her arms up, or in downward dog, her head through, as far as Bob. Now would they be feeling it the same way? No, because Bob is totally relaxed, taking the strain into his shoulder. Ivy is contracting to artificially hold herself there. If two people look the same from the outside, they're not feeling it the same on the inside. Because no one's skeleton is exactly like someone else's. Next, very simple, the neck, the cervical vertebra. We're going to demonstrate, does compression occur going backwards the same for everybody? Does compression occur going forward the same for everybody? You would think a very simple movement like that would be the 